Okay, so let's discuss properties of electric charge. So now we have had an introduction with electric charge. So now let's move on to what are the properties of electric charge. Properties. So what are the properties of electric charge? So the first property is additivity. So that is the first property of electric charge. Additivity. Now before that, you need to remember, I'm introducing a term called point charge. What is a point charge? If the distance between the bodies is way more as compared to their size, then these bodies are known as point charge, right? So for example, if I have a chalk and if I have one more chalk, all right? So right now, I know that these are bodies, all right? But what happens is, and if I charge these bodies and if the distances between th these two bodies are, is way more than their size, then these, point, these two bodies can be called as point charges all right so that's how you define point charges so these are point charges if the distances between them is way more as compared to their individual sizes so that's how a point charge is defined so what is additivity so that's the first property of charge so additivity means charges can be added similar to the real numbers like the numbers that we have integers so we can add like 2 plus 2 is 3. So in the same way, charges can be added as normal numbers. So for example, so as we already know, we have positive and negative charge that we have already established. For example, I have plus 3 charge and minus 2 charge. So these are two charges. All right. So I can, so total charge of the system would be plus 3 minus 2. That would be 1. All right. So these charges can be added similar to numbers. So this is a property of charge, one of the property of charge. Now let's move on to the second property of charge. So what does second property of charge say? So it says that charges are conserved. So what is conserved? I'll tell you the meaning of that as well, because that is an important concept. Charge is conserved. So what does conserve mean? So this is an important term. So this would be used uh, in, in many areas. You will see conservation of energy or conservation of mass. So this is conserved. This, what does conserved mean? Conserved means constant. It doesn't change. So if I conserve something, it remains the same. It won't change. That is what conservation means or conserved means, right? So you can write it. So it means constant. So what does charge is conserved mean? What it means is for an isolated system, just listen to me first, then I'll explain what isolated means. For an isolated system, the total charge is conserved. So what it means is, so let's say if I have an isolated system, in this system, if I have zero amount of charge, all right, so zero amount of charge, then after some time, if I look into this system, the total charge will still remain zero. That is, the charge is conserved. It remains constant. So it was zero before and it was zero afterwards. The only condition, it has to be isolated. What does isolated mean? There is no external forces acting on it. This is what isolated means. So what it means is it is cut off from everything and it is one system that we are talking about. So this is what it means. So initial charge remains equal to final charge. So let's say initially, one more example, let's say initially if I had plus 3 charge, so finally also I'll have plus 3 charge no matter what happens within the system. Alright, so I'll give you an example so that it might be more clear when you look at that example it would be more clear so for example if i if i talk about zero charge before and zero charge afterwards so initially let's say if i have if i have a neutron all right 
if I have a neutron, so what is neutron? So neutron is something that has zero charge. That is what neutron is. It doesn't have charge at all. So zero is neutron's charge. Now, let's say there's some process which happens, because it generally happens in nuclear physics, that the neutron breaks into electron and proton, two different particles. So what happens is, electron and proton. That is what a neutron breaks into. Now when the neutron breaks into electron proton, electron has negative one charge and proton has plus one charge. Alright, now this initially the charge of the system was zero. If I go to final, I have, although I have two different particles as compared to the initial particle, but the net charge of the system is still zero. This is what conservation of charge means. So initial charge and the final charge, it remains zero. There's no change. So same thing, if I, if, let's say, if, if I had, for another, if I take another example, so this is important. You need to understand this, this is important. Because you need to understand what is conservation. Because this would be used many times. So you need to get this in your head, all right? So conservation, remains constant. So for example, if I have a system of plus one and minus two charge, all right, so if this is my isolated system, so the final system, if I have, let's say, zero here, all right, so then the net charge has to be constant. So initially, what was the net charge? Minus one, so plus one minus two is minus one. So final, what I should have is minus one. So that net charge remains constant. So the initial charge has to be equal to final charge. The particles, the, these charges will redistribute the, uh, amongst themselves. But the thing is, the net charge has to be constant. It can't change. So that's the only thing that we have in, when we say that charge is conserved. Now, let's move on to third property that we have. So, because we already discussed that uh, charge is conserved. So what the third property says is quantization of charge. So this is an important concept. Quantization of charge. All right. So this is 30 property and this is the most important property. So I need you to consider what quantization of charges because you might have heard about quantization in your when you when you are studying structure of atom as well. So just remember what I'm saying. Just get get this clear because there won't be any confusion after this. What is quantization? Quantization means the process of existing in quantums. Now, what is quantum? So, quantum is some discrete value. All right. So, for example, things when when something is quantized, so when quantization of something occurs, so it can't exist in any values. They have to be. There has to be some discrete value in which it, it has to exist. So, for example, I'll give you an example. All right. So, for example, if these balls are there, all right, so if something is quantized, what does that mean is it has to exist either in this or combination of this or a combination of this. It can't just be this, this ball and half ball. All right, you understand what I'm saying? So it has to be discrete quantities and these quantities have to be equal to the basic quantity that I have. Right, so you can you can also talk in terms of packets. So it has to be constant packets. So one packet, two packet, three packet. This is what quantization is. It can't exist in some any random values. It has to be fixed discrete value, different values. Just understand this. All right, it has to be some dis distinct values. It can't exist in just random values. All right, so this is what quantization is. And quantum is the smallest packet that we have, is known as quantum, all right? Now, and the plural of that is quanta, 
quantum. Just remember this. Now, the question is what is quantization of charge? So again, quantization of charge means it has to exist in discrete packets. It can't exist in any random value. So that is what quantization of charge means. So now let's explain quantization of charge a bit. So for example, so firstly, so what, what it means is, so any charge that is there, any charge that you see in the world that is there has to be a multiple of some discrete value. It can't exist in any random value, but some discrete value that we'll call E, it has to be multiple of that, where N is an integer. All right, so it can be minus one, minus two, zero, one, two, but it won't be decimal that you have to remember. It won't be decimal, so it has to be some integer and any charge in the world would be a multiple, integral multiple of the basic unit that is E. All right, so now let us explain what E is. E is what I call elementary unit of charge. Now what is elementary unit of charge? This is the basic unit of charge that is there. So basic unit, the smallest unit of charge that is there. All right, so let's explore this a bit. So now what it means is, so E is the charge on the basic particle that we have on proton that is plus E on electron that is minus E electron All right so this E is the basic unit of charge that is there so that's how we define the elementary unit of charge now the value of E so what is the value of E that we have so value of E we have is 1.6 into 10 raised to power minus 19 coulomb and remember this is not exactly equal this is approximately equal. so further we have value 1.602 and further values are there but normally we use this value 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb and remember coulomb this is coulomb so this is unit of charge so this is named after coulomb we'll discuss about coulomb force and then we'll talk more about coulomb so just remember for now so this is unit of charge that is there so e remember what e is don't ever get confused after this all right so what e is e is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb and this is the basic unit of charge elementary unit of charge that exists on electron electron and proton so one proton has this basic unit of charge e that is plus 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19. One electron has minus 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. So this is how elementary unit of charge is defined. And any charge that we have in this world will be multiple of E, integral multiple of E. It can't be in decimal. The only exception that we have is quarks. Quarks is what protons are made of. So they we have value 1 by 3 of E. So in quarks, but the thing is quarks, they exist in groups. So that's why in this case also the quantization thing works. All right. Now what I want to discuss is how big is one Coulomb that I want to discuss. So let's discuss that. So how big is one Coulomb? So we said that the unit of charge is one Coulomb, this Coulomb. So what is one Coulomb is Q. So that is the charge, all right? So how much is one Coulomb? So as we said, Q equals NE, where E is the basic unit of charge and N is any integer that we have. So Q, now in, term, in place of Q, we have one, that is one Coulomb, equals N is the number of electron, and obviously Q will have minus one, because that is what we are finding, number of electrons. So electrons have negative, negative charge. So minus one N into 
1.6 into 10 raised to power minus 19. All right. Now, the value of n that we get, so obviously this would be negative as well. So because uh, on an electron we have negative charge, so this negative negative cancels out. So n we get is 1 by 1.6 into 10 raised to power minus 19. So this will get equal to 6 into 10 raised to power 18 electrons. So this is the value of n. Remember, so 1 coulomb is a very big unit of charge. So in that we have 6 into 10 raised to power 18 electrons. Remember how big is 10 raised to power 18. So after 1 we have 18 zeros. So it's a huge number. Right? So this is how, how many electrons that we have. So that's why normally we don't use this much big unit of charge. What we use is millicoulomb. So millicoulomb would be 10 raised to power minus 3 coulomb or micro coulomb. So micro would be 10 raised to power minus 6 coulomb. Alright, so these are the units of charges that we use. And remember, so what happens is quantization of charge is a concept that is only applicable, only significant. It's not applicable, it's significant only at microscopic level. The reason is, I'll give you any, uh, the reason for this. So what happens is, if I look at microscopic level, so I'll show you an example. So let's say if I draw a line, all right. So let's say this line is drawn from points, dots. So if I look at this line at microscopic level, so what I'll see is this line I am drawing. So this is composed of dots, small, small, small dots. But if I go farther away, what I'll see is, I'll see continuous line. So that is what quantization is. Quantization is, so they, they, they exist as discrete packets, small, small packets. So when we talk about Coulomb, so Coulomb is a big unit of charge. So that is 6 into 10 to the power 18 electrons. All right. So when we deal with Coulomb, so the, the basic unit of charge that we have is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. So that is the basic unit of charge. So when we talk in terms of coulomb or micro coulomb or milli coulomb, so we don't consider charges as discrete particles. So it becomes a continuous charge because we have so much high, high amount of charge that this value existing of the, the concept of uh, charges existing as small packets of 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19, then again 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19, this becomes less significant. So that's why quantization is only applicable when we see at microscopic level. Because microscopic level, we talk about electrons, each electron, when the charges is less, less amount of charge that we have. So then we talk about like very less few number of electrons. But when we go to like one coulomb, then we have 600 times power 18 electrons and talking about electrons in terms of each packet each electron having this value becomes less significant all right so now let's move on to the important topic coulomb's law so let's discuss about coulomb's law and let's see what coulomb's law has to say All right, so Coulomb's law. So this law was given by Charles Augustin de Coulomb. So he lived from 1739 till 1806. All right. So Charles Augustin de Coulomb in 1785 gave a law which was known as Coulomb's law, which quantified, remember the word, it quantified the force between two point charges. So what does that mean? So we we have already discussed from before that if two charges are there, they will experience a force. So either they will be attracted to each other, like charges, they attract to each other, 
or the charges that are opposite they will repel each other sorry like charges they will repel each other and opposite charges will attract each other but do we have a quantity do, do we do we have a value for that no so initially we didn't have the value for that but Mr. Coulomb, what he did was he quantified the value for the force between two charges. So let's see that how he did it. All right. So he gave a law in 1785 that was known as Coulomb's law, which stated that the force between two point charges, remember point charges. So I'll denote these point charges as Q1 and Q2 and what are point charges again? So when the distance between the two charges is way more as compared to their sizes. So the distance is way more compared to the sizes. That's how that's why they are known as point charges. All right. So what he said was the force acting between these two point charges who is directly proportional to product of these charges and is inversely proportional to the distance between them so i have equation one and i have equation two so this is what coulomb's law stated let this distance between them be r so this is what coulomb's law stated so when there are two charges so the force acting between these, these two charges is directly proportional to the product of the two charges and inversely proportional to the distance between these two charges all right so this was what he stated and if i combine equation one and two combining one and two what i get is the force and this force is electrostatic force or we also call it as coulomb's force so what it is is the combining one and two we get force is directly proportional to q1 q2 pi r square all right now if i remove the this proportionality i i'll have to remove this proportional sign i'll use k i'll use equal to so when i use equal to there's a co constant that comes along in q1 q2 by r square so that is the force that is acting between these two charges and remember this is magnitude forgot this this is magnitude so this is what coulomb gave so he gave the magnitude of the force so right now there is no vector force just don't consider that this will will consider a vector afterwards so right now is just magnitude of force so that is what coulomb's law stated the magnitude of force acting between two point charges is directly proportional to the product and inversely proportional to the distance between them and this is what we call coulomb force or electrostatic force why electrostatic because these charges have to be stationary remember this is the condition these are not moving so that is when coulomb's law is applicable so this is what he said so force acting between two charges is directly proportional so let me rewrite this and let's consider this again so force magnitude of force is directly proportional so there is a constant k so force is equal to k times q1 q2 by r square all right so this is what he said now this if you look at this this is similar to something we already know that is the gravitation force so gravitation force value is g m1 m2 by r square see that see the similarity there's a constant in space of mass we have charges and distance is r square so this is gravitation force fg all right so this both are similar the only difference that we have is this is always attractive the gravitation force is always attractive but this force depending upon whether the charges are same or they are different it will be either repulsive or the force will be repulsion or attraction so this acts in both direction this is only attractive that's the difference between all right now discussing about the value of k so k is what we have is equal to 1 by 4 pi 
epsilon naught. Remember this, and the value for k is 9 into 10 raised to the power 9. Alright, now epsilon naught is what we call permittivity, permittivity of free space. Okay, so now what does permittivity of free space means? So permittivity of free space means how much does the free space, what is free space? Vacuum. So there is nothing in between two charges. So there is free space. That's why it is known as free space. So there is nothing in between. So epsilon naught is permittivity of free space. How much does it allow for the electric field to pass through it? The vacuum, how much does it allow for the electric field to pass through it? That's why, that, that is what it is known as permittivity of free space. That is given by epsilon naught. Remember, epsilon is a Greek letter. All right. Epsilon. So there are many Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma. Just go online and search for Greek letters. There are 24 Greek letters. In English, we have 26. So just go through these Greek letters because in physics, you'd be using these symbols many times. So get familiar with these Greek letters. Okay. Epsilon is a Greek letter. So epsilon naught is permittivity of free space. All right. So now let's put this value of k in this 1 by 4 and let's rewrite the Coulomb's law. So rewriting Coulomb's law gives me a new equation, so which is force is equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught q1 q2 by r square. Remember, this is magnitude. So we are still not talking about vector. We are still not talking about directions. All right. So 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught and q1 q2 by r square the value for epsilon naught that we have is 8.85 into 10 raised to the power minus 12 and now talking about units i'll get the units for this from this equation so when i take epsilon naught here and force come, comes down so the the unit for epsilon naught becomes coulomb square force would be newton per newton per meter square all right per newton per meter square per meter square i got from r all right so this is the value for epsilon naught that we have so this is what coulomb's law is in terms of magnitude all right now the thing is force is a vector all right we already know what force is force is a vector now we need to know the directions in which direction the forces are acting so now let's move on to the force being a vector and let's introduce the directions based on that all right so before that let me see all right then yeah just one more thing so yeah so coulomb's law was discovered by mr coulomb using something called torsional balance torsional balance so torsional balance is it was an instrument so this was also used by mr cavendish to calculate the value of capital g the g that comes in f equals g m1 m2 by r square so mr cavendish discovered this value of g Remember, Newton never discovered the value of g that we have 6.67. So, uh, into 10 to the power 11, minus 11. Newton never discovered this. So, Mr. Cavendish, he was the one who discovered the value of g. And so, he used the same torsional balance and same thing was used by Mr. Coulomb in order to calculate this, in order to arrive to this equation. And also, uh, what he said was, what he did was, so firstly he fixed the distance, so R was fixed, so then he calculated the effect of uh, the two charges and he varied the two charges, then in the second process what he did was he varied distance and he kept the charges constant, so that's how he arrived at this equation. Alright, now let's move on to the vector form of Coulomb's law. So it's an interesting thing to see, because you, what you will see is you will see Coulomb's law in terms of 
directions and in terms of how the, the vector form of Coulomb's force. All right. So now let's move on to this. So before moving on, let me introduce a few things. Yeah. So what we'll introduce is we'll introduce the position vector of any charge. There would be a single origin and we would be uh, introducing the position vector of both of the charges. So now what we are discussing right now is Coulomb's law in vector form. And this is force acting between two charge particles. All right, so let's say we have two point charge particles. So we have two point charges Q1 and Q2. So these are in space. All right, so now we have to give them a position vector. What is the position vector? Position vector is, is a vector which determines the position, which determines the position of the charges. So that's how vectors are. The, the uh, purpose of vectors is to give a fixed position in terms of directions to any object that we have in space. So let's say we have an origin here. All right. So from here we give this value R1 and this R2. So these are two position vectors that we have. All right. R1, R2. So let me write Q1 properly here. So this is Q1. All right. So two charges, Q1, Q2, two point charges, and R1 and R2, two position vectors that we have. Okay. So now, what we are concentrating is, so there, there would be force acting on Q2 due to Q, Q1, and there would be force acting on Q1 due to Q2. All right. So these are the forces that are acting between them. So let's say if I have a charge Q1 and if I have a charge Q2, so Q1 would be exp would be giving a force, would be exerting a force on Q2. It might be it might be uh, like repulsive force or attractive force based on what Q2 is. So in our problem, in our der derivation, what we do is we take both of these charges as positive point charges. All right. So this is just for simplification purpose. We can have both negative as well or one positive, one negative. But what we do is we derive a general form. So that in this you can put in the if, if there is other charge as well, if there is negative charge, you can put in the value of negative charge in that equation and you can arrive at the direction based on that. So we use positive point charges because we want to generalize it. All right. Then. So talking in terms of these, so firstly what we are doing is, so remember these two terms, so we, we are using this, so F21, I'll give it a vector form, so F21 is the force exerted onto, remember the one that is in front, we talk about that, so F21 is the force exerted on 2 due to 1, that is F21, F 1, 2, in similar way, is the force exerted on 1 due to 2. Force on 1 due to 2. So we have defined these. Now, let me define one more term. That is R, 2, 1. Alright. So what is R, 2, 1? R, 2, 1 is a position vector from 1 to to 2 all right r to 1 so we have to reach 2 that is what we are talking about r to 1 r to from 1 similarly r 1 2 is we have to reach 1 from 2 all right so this would be in opposite direction r 1 2 remember this all right hopefully it's clear uh, all right so these are the directions so remember these conventions all right don't ever get confused so r21 is we have to reach 2 from 1 so from 1 to 2 is r21 r12 is opposite direction and same for forces now and also remember this 
R, the value for R to 1, if I go here, so R to 1 is in this direction. So let me draw this triangle once again. So I'm rubbing R1 2 so that we don't have any confusion here. And I'll rub this one as well. All right. So now R to 1 is from 1 to 2, R to 1. And using also, if you see here, if you talk about this triangle, so using triangle law, R2, R2, 1, value would be R2 minus R1. Alright, so how, how do I get there? See, if I use triangle law, so R1, so these head to tail, so R1 plus R2, 1 is equal to R2, so R2, 1 is equal to R2 minus R1. Alright, so this is what I get. So R21 is equal to R2 minus R1. So similarly, R12 would be R1 minus R2. So you can get this, just uh, take the arrow backwards. So R21 this way, R12 this way. So in this, what we get is R21 is equal to R12 negative. Remember this. Alright. And what else do we have? We have R21. This is a vector. So R21, R21 is, uh, sorry, what we'll do is we'll, we'll define a unit vector. R21 cap. R21 cap. So what is R21? So what is R21 cap? R21 cap is a unit vector which is pointing in the direction of the vector R21. So that is how R21 cap. So R21 cap gives the direction, only direction. It's a unit vector, it has magnitude 1. So that is what a unit vector is. The value for this is R21 vector divided by magnitude R21. Alright, magnitude R21 cap. Alright, so this is what R21 cap is. Now let's write, so we have discussed all of this. So now let's write Newton's, uh, sorry, now let's write Coulomb's law in terms of the vector. All right. So now you have to remember Coulomb's Coulomb force acts in the direction of force. So because both of them are positive, so force exerted on 2, F2, F2, 1, that is force exerted on 2 due to 1 would be in this direction. Remember, because this both are positive, so this is exerting force in this direction on this 2. So F21 value would be given as 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. So Q1, Q2 by R21 square. Alright, so R21 is the magnitude, R21. And since this is a vector, so we will have R21 cap. Remember this? So this we already know, Q1, Q2 by R2 square. So that is the magnitude that we have. What is R21 cap? R21 cap is a unit vector pointing in the direction. So as you already said, R21 cap is a unit vector. So this will be pointing in this direction. So this is what F21 is. Now if I need to write F12, F12 would be Q1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. Q1, Q2 by r12 square and the unit vector would be r12 so f12 is the force exerted on 1 due to 2 so this would be in this direction so coulomb's force acts along the line so now so q1 q2 by r12 square r12 is the magnitude so r12 would be pointing in this direction r12 and r12 cap is a unit vector that gives so this is the magnitude and this is the direction so magnitude plus direction would give me a vector so f12 is vector now from this we have already seen that r21 and r12 are in opposite direction so what we had seen is r21 is minus of r12 all right so similarly r21 cap would be minus of r12 cap all right now why? Because this 
this is just magnitude so these two magnitude that will divide with r12 and r21 so both would be equal they will cancel out so we'll get to both of them unit factors so this is what we get now from this equation the above equation this is second equation so first equation from 1 and 2 what we can conclude is f21 is minus of f12 so this is the conclusion that we have and this obeys newton's third law what is newton's third law equal and opposite forces all right so this is what it is so these two forces that are being exerted between them both of the coulomb's forces are equal and opposite in direction so f21 is negative of minus f12 now let's move on and let's discuss force acting between multiple charges all right so right now what we did was we discussed between just two charges all right so now what about if you have multiple charges what should we do what is the method for calculating the forces between multiple charges so for multiple charges what we have is so let's say let's say we have a system where we have multiple charges so q1 so firstly we'll consider just three charges q1 q2 q3 all right so let's say we have q1 here we have q2 here and we have q3 here all right sorry we have q1 we have q2 here now as we have already said that these are positive point charges point charges that we have already said now the force acting on q1 so this is what we are determining we are finding the force acting on a charge due to the presence of other charges the force acting on q1 is equal to the vector sum of all the forces that is acting taken one at a time all right so that is how we define the force acting on q1 due to q2 and q3 so remember what we said is this is positive charge so all of them are positive so force acting on if uh, force acting on q1 due to q2 is this way let me rub this so that it will be much clearer here okay so force acting on q1 due to q2 is in this direction so that we call f1 f1 two remember how we class uh, how we define f1 two so force acting on one due to three would be let me write q1 here q1 has to be here so force acting on q1 due to three is f1 three so what is vector sum so vector sum uh, parallelogram based on parallelogram uh, law factor addition so this would give me f1 so f1 is the total force acting so f1 so these all of them are vectors so f1 is f12 plus f13 let me write it here so f1 is equal to f12 plus f13 so this is what we call as principle of super position all right so this is what principle of superposition is the force acting on a charge due to other charges is independent of the presence of other charge and is equal to the total vector sum of all the charges that are there and it acts along this direction the, along the line straight line all right so this is what principle of superposition is now let's do this let me rub this so this is what we got so f1 is a total force acting so is equal to f12 plus f13 this is principle of superposition and let us write so f1 so that is total force so that is equal to q1 q2 obviously 1 by 4 pi epsilon not is there 1 by 4 pi epsilon not q1 q2 by r12 square 
and this is R12 cap plus 1 by 4 pi this is F13 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 into Q3 by R13 square R13 cap so these are the two equations that we have now let's say if I have n number of charges so I, what I can do is I can arrive at the general formula if I have n number of charges there's a system where I have 1 2 3 4 5 till n how do I define that so let's see that so remember this so if I have n charges so what I'll do is so F1 is the total force acting on the charge what we have is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught so this would be F1 is equal to F1 due to 2 plus F1 due to 3 plus still I'll go F1 due to nth charge all right because I have n charges so there is one charge Q1 so on that I'll consider the force 2 3 4 till n charges that I have so 1 by 4 by epsilon naught so this is Q1 Q2 by R12 square so this is R12 cap plus now let me rub this so rub this off so now the second is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 Q2 by R I'm sorry Q1 Q3 so there's 1 3 so this is Q1 Q3 R13 square R13 cap and similarly if I go I'll reach 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 Qn R1n square and R1n cap all right so the, all the system of n charges system of n charges all right then now you'll see a pattern here all right I'll show what the pattern is so let me write a general form so f1 so 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught is common so I'll take 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught outside what else do I have common I have q1 common so I'll write q1 here okay so what am I left with I'll write a general equation so that you can see it so this let me write it first the so summation qi by r1i square and this is r1i cap all right and this i is from 2 till n now why have I written this because qi i is from 2 to n so qi if I put 2 so I'll get this one so in t q2 and r12 then r12 cap so this is what I get if I put i equals 3 I'll get this so I'll go till n and I'll sum it so this is why I use summation sign I'll sum each of the charges and this is the general formula all right so this is what super, uh, superposition principle is using superposition principle we can get the force acting on a charge due to n charges system of n charges what is the force acting on a single charge so here we use the same Coulomb's law all right so now we have concluded this now in the next part what we will say is we will talk about electric field how electric field is responsible for the charges the forces acting on the charges right now what we have introduced is about charges the properties of charges so in the next part we will talk about Gauss law and electric field all right so before we conclude so I want to share with you one thought so this is something that I have written so just to enlighten you so there's something for you guys so your textbooks are books of secrets they let you know all the secrets that govern the magical world you see around thank you